Today I'm going to be talking about Ehara Seikaku. He was one of the first professional writers to come out of Japan, if not Japan's first professional writer. He was born in 1642, and his given name was likely Hirayama Toku. Ehara Saikaku was born in Osaka, Japan as a member of the merchant class because his father was a merchant. His passion at a young age was composing haikai poetry, and he didn't lose that passion throughout his life. It wasn't as if Ihara Saikaku transitioned from writing poetry to prose, but he kind of combined the way he would compose his different literary devices, and even in his novels, you can read a lot of aspects that are very poetic, such as when he's describing the settings of his stories. He would even lead groups of students in poetry on writing haikai. And he continued this passion after he inherited the family business and begin doing that work. So in his 20s, he was known as a haikai master, and he's very well known for his linked poetry as well. In the 17th century, Saikaku was very well known for writing about taboo subjects, and he didn't shy away from being very blunt and real about what was going on in the urban centers in Japan. His content was very diverse, and he tackled some of the taboo subjects that he tackled were life and their relation to desire, sex, love, and money, and that's as well as homosexuality and prostitution. So you can imagine in 17th century Japan, these were not things that were written about very commonly. So he would write of the floating world and he became very closely related with that concept which was portraying the urban centers of Japan relating to fleeting pleasures and desire. And in 17th century Japan, Saikaku's writing was very well known and it was considered very entertaining, but at that time it wasn't necessarily looked upon as literature as it is today. At the age of 25 was a big turning point for Saikaku as his wife died very suddenly. And it's reported he may have lost a daughter around that time as well. It was at this point that Saikaku left the family business that he had inherited and went into retirement. But retirement for Saikaku did not mean to cease working. He definitely continued writing at a large quantity at that. There are conflicting reports as to if Saikaku became a monk after the death of his wife, or if he just traveled around Japan not living a monk's life, but as a simple observer and partaking in no kind of spiritual quest. But regardless of Saikaku's spiritual status at this time, it is known that he did continue writing and continued writing a lot. The first of his writing in prose that he published was Kishoku Ichide Atoku. He put out the very successful Life of an Amorous Man in 1682. And in 1686, he published the work that we're going to be talking about today, which is Life of a Sensuous Woman. That's a publication of his that went on to become a national bestseller. Saikaku is very well known for the quantity of his work, and he would compose at an incredible speed, and there was one year between 1687 and 1688 that he actually put out 12 books. Saikaku was a writer of poetry, fiction of the warrior class, and satire as well. The quantity of Saikaku's literary contributions, as well as his influence over the Japanese literary style, is 
far too voluptuous to summarize all of the different ways he has influenced the culture of Japanese writing today. He was just incredibly influential on Japanese literature and modern Japanese writers. Saikaku also formed many different concepts used today, and just one of which is the Yuki Yozoshi form of writing poetry. Ahara Saikaku died on September 3rd, 1693. And as I said, being one of the first professional writers out of Japan, he is incredibly renowned and has just left an incredible legacy, not only in Japan, but across the world. I'm going to be reading a passage today that comes out of A Monk's Wife in a Worldly Temple. And at this point of the story, it follows the woman once she has taken on the role of the priest's mistress and lives in his temple. And she starts out very sad and depressed and she's kind of lost that adolescent love that she had spoken about at the beginning of the story. This is after she has become used to her surroundings and it's very startling to me because it's one of the first signs that she's losing who she is. So it starts, later I got used to the situation and I even came to enjoy it. When the priest went out to chant sutras at a parishioner's house on the night after a death or on a memorial day, I found myself waiting up late, wishing he would come back. And when he went out at dawn to pray over the ashes of a cremated person, I felt as if we were saying goodbye to each other, and I hated for him to be away, no matter how short a time it was. Even the smell of incense on his white robe clung to my body and seemed dear to me. After a while, I forgot my loneliness, and I started to like the sounds of gongs and cymbals at the ceremonies. At first, you know, I would hold my hands over my ears whenever I heard them, and my nose got used to the smell from the crematory. The more deaths there were, well, the happier I was, since there was more offerings for the temple. So the woman at this point has just become enraptured in this life in the temple and her role as the priest's mistress. And she's kind of just there for whatever he needs her to be. And so I find this to be a very startling passage because it's the first signs of the woman really losing who she is and any aspirations that she once held dear for her life, and it's just so parallel to the passage prior where she even said this was just a job and there was no love in it. The woman had said, it was just a job, there was no love in it. I had to give myself to that disgusting priest day and night. So you can really see the contrast between this line from the passage prior to how the woman is feeling now. Now it seems as if she's very delusional and she's lost her sense of what love once was to her and she's confusing how she feels for the priest and how horrible he treats her for love. And I find that to be a very sad thing for the woman at this point. So I find it a very pivotal point in the story where the woman's life really takes a dark turn. Thankfully, soon after this point in the story, she is visited by the old woman who kind of has the same role that she has now, only she's a discarded mistress of the priest and she sees that dark future that could possibly lay ahead for her if she's to continue down this path. Which, unfortunately, she does, and that is what makes Ehara Saikaku's characters stand out, is because in 17th century Japan, 
there weren't characters that were this real and honest and it's just so renowned today, this type of confession narrative of the woman giving these very intimate details of her life.